Hello everyone, and welcome to another episode of Ray Hall Tech. In today's episode, I want to explore turning this OEM PC into a gaming computer. I really like the HP Z series computers, and this one is a Z620. It's a Xeon workstation with ECC memory, and all in I spent about $430 to build this gaming computer, and I think it's a really good cost-effective solution to building a gaming computer right now, especially since a lot of parts are hard to find or may be really expensive. So let's get into building a gaming PC from this OEM computer, and I'll talk about what I worked on along the way. One of the reasons I really like HP computers is that they're often toolless. So let me go ahead and open this cover, and uh, you can get a look inside of this computer. When I first purchased this computer, it had a dead Quadro card in it, and so I put in this GT710. This is actually just my tester graphics card that I use when I need to make sure a computer system is up and working properly. When I got this system, it actually had 24 gigabytes of RAM, but I kept having memory errors. And if I pull out the memory shroud here, you can see that uh, the shroud actually cools the memory. It's got a fan here and one in the back. And then there's also the cooling fan for the processor. But the computer kept having memory errors, and I thought I would reseat the memory. It turned out that one of the DIMMs was a low power DIMM and the rest of them are not low power. So I'm not sure if that's why this computer was sold because they thought the memory was bad. But I took out 8 gigs of memory dropping this down to 16 gigs so that it would operate successful and there are no more memory errors. In addition to that, this computer had mechanical hard drives. It does have hardware RAID built in. So right now, I have its original two 500 gig hard drives as a RAID array, a hardware RAID just to build a one terabyte drive. That's where I'm gonna store the games when I go to test this computer. And then in this drive bay, a solid state drive, I just double sided taped it to the bracket, but we're gonna boot off of a solid state drive. And I have used this computer before as a workstation, like I said. And with these drives in here, uh, I've got Windows 10 Professional installed. But after we get everything put together, I'll go ahead and get games and drivers installed, and we'll get this computer up and running completely. And one last note. Originally, when I bought this computer, it had a 4-core, four 4-thread four CPU. I upgraded to an 8-core, 16-thread CPU. Uh, just to make this computer have a little bit more processing power as a workstation. And with that, let me go ahead and put my, my shroud back in and lock it into place so we have proper cooling. This computer, this little black cover here might seem a little bit odd. If I lift that up just a hair, you can see that black cover. If you pull out this black cover, there is a power connector here that is also proprietary. This connector, along with this hidden black connector, that will allow you to plug in a processor module that fills in the rest of this space, so you can add a second ZP Xeon CPU to this and more memory. But I don't have any of those modules, but you need a paired CPU on both and then memory on both as well. So these computers can handle multiple CPUs. But to get started, like I said, these cases are toolless. So I'm gonna pop this open. Uh, it's just a small latch in the back. And we're gonna lift out the GT710. The reason I like this as a tester card is it gives me VGA, HDMI, and DVI. So I can pretty much connect to any monitor, new and old. And it works really great for a very low cost. So I've unboxed the wireless card. Here you can see it just has a regular uh, keyed wireless card. So you could probably swap this out in the future to upgrade your wireless. Again, this is a Wi-Fi 5 card with Bluetooth 4. But if you ever wanted to use this module, you could probably put a Wi-Fi 6 module in here with Bluetooth 5. And uh, this USB connection here, this is actually what connects the Bluetooth. Uh, so that may make it a little bit weird. But what I'm gonna do is remove this slot cover that's closest to the CPU. I would like to put this Wi-Fi card all the way back so that there's plenty of airflow for the GTX 970. Or, I'm sorry, it's a 960. So let me just go ahead and plug this into its slot. Okay, 
And then I'm going to route this cable now to a USB header. And it looks like it'll plug in straight this way. I don't have to rotate it at all. And then I'm just going to kind of tuck it down here so that the cable stays nice and low and uh, kind of hangs out of the way of my graphics card when I put that in. Here, this particular card is an EVGA card with two cooling fans. Um, I don't really like blower style cards, so I always try and find uh, cards with uh, the heat sink exposed like this. And it's an 8-pin PCI connector. Let me go ahead and remove this slot cover. And I'm going to slide this graphics card in next. The uh, slot cover uh, kind of fell into place. With the card fully seated, it is locked in place. Anytime you have a graphics card like this, it should lock in place completely. With uh, both of my cards in place, I'm going to go ahead and just bring the uh, slot cover down and lock it back in place. Again, uh, because this is toolless, it's just a clamp, so uh, once it's in there tight, you can see if I kind of lift on it with my thumb, it's not coming up. So now my cards are locked into place completely. And unfortunately, the, one of the gotchas that you have with pre-built computers is the power supply. A lot of times they can be proprietary. And in this case, this power supply power supply, sorry about that, is completely proprietary. It slides in and uh, locks in with a small connector down here. This connector then feeds to wires that are actually behind the metal back plate. And uh, it's not possible to fit a standard size power supply in this case. So when I was shopping for different HP computers, I wanted to make sure that it had two six-pin PCI Express power connectors. You may need to look for that on a pre-built computer. You don't always hear about that uh, when it comes to the power supplies. You may not be able to plug them in. Another big problem with HP power supplies and Lenovo as well, sometimes the pinouts are not the same as the standard power supply, so you also often have to buy an adapter cable uh, so that you can plug them into a motherboard or if you wanted to get a pre-built case and put it in a standard case to improve its looks. But again, this computer is so proprietary with its special cooling, uh, none of it is standard that it can't be taken out of this case. And I have no problem adapting two 6-pin PCI Express power connectors into an 8-pin. Uh, you'll usually always have enough power if you were to do that. I don't like to convert SATA or Molex for my PCI cards, just for uh, power and safety purposes. But with that, uh, we've got our solid state drive, we've got a game storage drive. If I was going to sell this computer, uh, I think I would go ahead and deraid these and just leave one of them in here and recommend that the purchaser replace one of these mechanical drives with a larger storage drive. And then we have a gaming graphics card now. And then with our processor and our RAM uh, all put back together, we're ready to reassemble the case. And I just got to figure out where I put the side panel. And this side panel does have a foam insert that will actually sit against the graphics card to kind of help hold it in place. So if this was uh, too big, I could take it off by pulling out the screws if the card was interfering. But this is actually just a great size to fit on with that card. With that locked in place, since I just put in the wireless card, I need to connect the wireless antennas to the back of the computer. So let me go ahead and stand up the computer and uh, we'll move over to the back of the case. So here we are looking at the back of the case. Please forgive the camera angle. My tripod is as short as it can possibly go and it still doesn't quite go low enough to catch the case sitting on the table. But this particular computer has PS2 ports, one for the keyboard and the mouse. It has regular USB 2, super speed USB 3. I'm sure this is first generation. There are two network interface cards. One of them is a regular NIC and the other one is a different chipset with active management technology. So I tend not to use that port. I tend to use this port uh, just because I never need AMT and I'm not using this in a business environment. And then we have a uh, stereo out, microphone in, and uh, line in. Sorry, I couldn't think of what I was uh, trying to go for there. And that's about it. Uh, this computer case, when I bought it, it does have the keys uh, to lock the side of the case. 
But let me go ahead and just screw on my antennas here. And uh, with this particular case, one of the things you have to watch out for uh, is the depth of this particular uh, fold in the case where the fans are. The Wi-Fi antennas, you can see they actually close. Let me turn that just a little bit right up next to the metal. So you have the ability to lean them out or turn them a different direction, but they will sit right on that metal. So if your antennas are too short, you may need a different brand of card if you're adding Wi-Fi to a pre-built computer. All right, Wi-Fi antennas are on. I'm ready to fire up this computer. So let me get a few games installed and then we'll start testing this computer to see what it can do. So I spent about $200 on the computer itself and uh, then I added wireless, as you saw in the video earlier. I wanted to make sure that this computer had Bluetooth, which you can see it's got Intel wireless Bluetooth, and uh, it's got this Intel AC Wi-Fi card. So again, that's Wi-Fi 5 and Bluetooth 4. Uh, I personally, as I mentioned earlier, prefer to always use a network cable, but I know that's not something that everybody can do. And having a wireless card and Bluetooth opens where you can put your computer, what accessories you can use, all of that kind of stuff. And then here, let me jump quickly over to disk management. And while that's pulling up, uh, my disk zero is a 240 gig SSD boot drive. And this was another $30-ish in the cost. Um, I bought the SSD on sale, but normally they're around $50, but you can watch for sales and get good deals on SSDs all the time. And then again, my disk one, this D drive, my data drive. In this particular computer, it's two 500 gigabyte drives that have been hardware rated together. And again, I wouldn't sell the computer like this. I would recommend the purchaser put in their own hard drive or rate it themselves just so that they understand what is going on and they don't have any issues with it after they purchase it. So let me close that out. The CPU in this computer is an Intel Xeon E5 2680. As I mentioned, when I bought the computer, I had a four core, four thread CPU. So I added $30 to my build cost to throw in this CPU. Otherwise I would have hit my $400 target. I just didn't like the way that four core CPU worked. But again, this CPU is an eight core, 16 thread CPU. And it just works better for my workload when I was using it. And now that we're turning this into a gaming PC, I think it'll be a much better balanced CPU for this graphics card. But we'll see what the numbers reveal when we get there. Let me go ahead and close that. And then finally, I bought an NVIDIA GeForce GTX 960. And this is the four gigabyte model if you look down here at the memory size. I try and avoid two gigabyte cards now. A lot of AAA games will fill up two gigs of memory fairly quickly. And so four gigs, I think, is kind of the minimum you want to shoot for here in 2020. But again, not everybody can find a four gig card and costs and parts availability are all over the place. But I spent about $127.50 on this card after shipping. And uh, poking around, i thinking that the highest card was around $220. I even found a scam card saying it was a GTX 960 for $90. But when I took a, an average of the top 30 cards on eBay, it uh, came out to about $142 average for this particular card. So I got an okay deal. It's just not the best deal. Um, under normal circumstances, I think the price of this card would have been a little bit less. Let me go ahead and close that and pop open my games folder. And so, as I mentioned, I filled this computer up with a lot of games just to get things going. Uh, let me make sure Riva Tuner is running, which it is. Uh, we're going to be using MSI Afterburner and Riva Tuner to try and get our frame rates and things like that. But I know that in some games it can be kind of tricky and something like Fortnite, when we go into Fortnite, it may think that I'm trying to use a cheating app and it could kick me out. So keep that in mind as we play. So we might have to do a little bit of jumping through hoops. But to get started, like any computer of this age, you can play a lot of old AAA titles and have an amazing experience. So I'm going to start here with the Elder Scrolls V Skyrim. This is the original version, I believe, not the remaster. But let's get this game started up. And uh, you can see here in the menu we're only at about 30 frames per second, which isn't that big of a deal. But once we actually get into the game, we should have pretty good performance. 
Um, in this game, I have a mod installed that makes me walk really fast. I hate how slow you move in Skyrim, and exploring can just take forever. But you can see we're at a consistent 60 frames per second, and I'm going to walk through that flame and start on fire. And you can see it's just, it's just working very well like it's supposed to. Well, I haven't picked a lock in Skyrim in a while. It's got to be over here somewhere. Huh. Alright, don't make fun of my uh, lock picking skills, because obviously I'm terrible at it. Oop, too far. There seems to be some kind of weird lag in this mouse, probably through the recording software, but... Anyway, I'm going to walk in here, and you can see it's it's working pretty well at 60 frames per second. Um, oh, and now we've got some combat, because I made all the bandits mad. So with that, um, again, old titles are always going to work pretty well on this. So let me go ahead and quit that and drop to my desktop. With the huge library of old games, I think building a computer for playing old games is always a great idea. And even if you buy a pre-built PC that has an older video card, some of these older AAA games will give you a great experience and these older computers will give you a great way into uh, gaming. The next game that we're going to look at is Shadow of the Tomb Raider. And uh, here in the menu, um, I'm not sure if it's frame limited or not, so you should see it jump all over the place. But uh, I'm just going to go ahead and load a game. I'm not sure where I'm at in this particular uh, playthrough of the game. Uh, I've never actually finished this game, but I've been playing with it here and there. Um, and I'd like to get back in and finish it because I finished the other two games. I think uh, I had just gotten to the point where you were starting to tie up the story and figure out what Trinity was up to in the game. But I could be wrong about that. It would be pretty awesome if uh, in-game we got the same frame rate we do on these load screens. On this particular computer, I'm running at 60 hertz, 60 frames per second. All right, so here we are in Shadow of the Tomb Raider, and I'm hitting 50 frames per second, um, which I think is a completely playable experience. And let's take a look at our options for our display and graphics. All right, so I'm using DirectX 11 mode. 1920 by 1080 because I figure most people are targeting either 1080 or 1440p gaming. I am in full screen mode and I don't have an exclusive full screen. I'm not sure why that's off. But uh, here you can see my monitor refresh rate is 60 hertz and it's locked. I can't actually change any of that setting. But I don't like uh, VSync on, especially in this case because that would limit me to 60 frames per second. But let's come over to graphics and you can see I'm using a custom preset here. But we can shut off a few things. Again, I shut off motion blur. Again, personal preference. But if I were to do something like uh, low settings, uh, we'll hit escape. We'll hit escape. So now you can see Tomb Raider is reloading the textures. And with lower settings, uh, I'm actually hitting 60 frames per second now. So by going from my custom preset to low settings, we went up to 60 frames per second. So again, on an older computer, depending on your frame rate target, you can adjust the quality of, of your game. Let me go ahead and drop out of Tomb Raider real quick. And uh, we'll jump into our next game, which is much more popular. I'm going to go ahead and launch Fortnite. All right, <clears throat> we're getting down to the end of the game. There's only a few people left. I'm not sure where everybody is at. So, just need to keep my eyes open for, for anybody. Get up here with my team and see what we can find. But here at the end of the game, you can see that we're doing a really good job 
of maintaining the 144 frames per second, which we've had for pretty much the entire game. Question is, I don't know where the last few people that I'm supposed to be fighting against are. There are two people in this game somewhere. Oh, I see one. Alright. And we just finished it with uh, 144 FPS on pretty much the entire game. The next game that I picked in my gauntlet of just quick games to show is Valorant. And here, running through an empty maze, you can see I'm pushing over 300 frames per second. Uh, in the right areas, you can see I can make it go over 400 frames per second, but that's not going to be a realistic uh, frame rate. I'd say 300 is where you're going to target for this game with a GTX 960, uh, especially... Uh, if you're in a match with uh, real players, there's just going to be a lot more going on. And I just didn't want to get into a game because 13 matches um, is a little bit more than I want to record for this video. But you can see Valorant is a popular game and it runs extremely well on this OEM computer. The last game that I want to showcase today is Rocket League. I know this is another super popular title. And you can see that it's running buttery smooth at 144 frames per second. Uh, when I first installed this game, it was frame limited to 62 frames per second. I guess that's what it calculated my screen at. I don't know. But keep that in mind uh, if uh, this is the first time you've played Rocket League on a computer that you need to actually uh, set your frame rate. And with that... As you can see, the variety of games that I have played today seem to run perfectly fine. Um, again, the only real real game issues that I have occasionally playing online is Stutter. And I don't think that's a problem, say, with Fortnite itself or something like that. I think it's just my internet connection, uh, some latency there, or in this case, I'm also using wireless, so that could be an issue as well. Games like Among Us or Rocket League are really easy to play, so an OEM computer can be made into a light gaming PC pretty easy for something like that. Games like Fallout 76, a AAA title from some game studios may be frame limited. You know, Fallout 76, Fallout 4, Fallout 3, they limited their frame rate to 60 FPS there for a while. I think there's a patch for Fallout 76 now that increases that, but having a, a computer that'll push the limit of some of these AAA titles. Um, you might need a little bit newer hardware or a little bit more powerful hardware, but again, an OEM computer from the last few years is going to be a lot more cost effective than building something from scratch, especially with the overpriced components in the market today and the lack of availability. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and sign off. Please give me a thumbs up if you like my content and subscribe to my channel. I will see you in a future video. Thank you so much.